All right, these are important stuff, that, and I want you to listen to it if possible. Stop your lap for a second, and I want your attention. Okay, I want your attention. I want your attention. Number one, number one, where do we include our files, uh, our header files? Where should we actually include our header files when we are coding? Oh, that's not a uh, question. I'm, I'm t giving you the topic for it that I'm going to tell right now. Uh, so you include your header files in the file in which that header file is needed, which means if there's a CPP file, you are having a C out in there, you include the header file. Okay? Do not include the header file indirectly through another header file. Never do that. Don't say that, okay, this header file is going to include that, so I'm going to put IO stream include in there. Don't do that. If in your header file you have an, an IO stream, then you include it. If in your header file you are having using a class that needs something, include it. And because you are always following the rules for safeguards, ignore that if you, like if, if you have a header file, a module with a header file and a CPP file, they are both using a class, include them both in both of them. Don't worry. Don't think like it's there, so I'm not going to do it here. Don't do that. Include it and don't worry about it. Do it. Okay? But include only where it's being used. If you are including something, like if you include IO stream and no scene and C out or O stream, F stream, anything is used in there, don't do it ever. That creates uh, excessive code to compile. You are essentially bringing the whole I.O. stream in a place where it's not used. Compiler goes through compilation with no use for it. So don't do it. Uh, number two, in interfaces, sometimes you need to have a destructor. A destructor can be virtual. It cannot be pure virtual. You cannot make an instructor instructor. A destructor virtual and set it to zero. A virtual destructor must have a body. Now, so that kind of defies the interface thingy because we say interface is all virtual. And if you do that, you're adding a body to it. So first try putting open curly bracket, close curly bracket right in the definition of the header file, semicolon at the end. Okay? So you are essentially having an inline empty destructor in there. This may cause error when you are doing include, includes because the body is going to get repeated. Okay? If that's the case, fine. Create a CPP file for your interface, and that file has only one destructor with an empty body. It's a very silly CPP file, but do it if it's needed, no problem. So if you need to have a virtual destructor in an interface, that's the way. You cannot make it pure virtual, all right? Reusing your code. In your uh, workshop that you were supposed to demonstrate reusing your code, you wrote a little thing, you called it twice, you said, I reuse my code. It's not just that. You have to keep doing it. At any place, even if you see one line is being repeated over and over and over, create a private member function, name it what that line does, and remove that line and put it in that function. If one logic is being repeated, it has to go to a function. Always. Okay? So if you have three variables that you see, you're always setting these three variables here, there, there, sometimes you're setting it to zero, sometimes. Instead of doing that, create a private method that is called setting these three, whatever they are. Get three arguments and set them. And recall that function instead of repeating those three lines. Which brings me to the next thing. When you have a data member, when you have a data member, and you are writing the code of that class, if that data member has a setter or a getter, what is a setter and a getter? Setter and a getter are functions that give access to that variable from outside, okay? If they have a setter and a getter, 
even in your methods, in your functions, in the class, use the setter and getter. Don't directly access the data member. Why? Because three years from now, you want to apply certain logic when that data member is set to something. For example, you've got to say, I'm setting the name of the employee. Now I want the name of employee not to contain any commas. So you want to apply that rule. If you have used the setter in your code, all you need to do, go to that setter function, apply the rule, it's done in all your code everywhere. If you don't do that, you have to spend weeks tracking to see where the heck I modified that thing. And I have to go through every single logic and try to find where that thing is being modified. So it's all, even if you want to do it obsessively, if you have a member uh, variable, and that member variable is an important thing that you think a logic is going to be applied to it and nobody's going to access it, there's no problem by creating a setter, a private one, only for the internal use. And use that one instead, if there is a logic to be applied to it, instead of repeating the logic. That was that. Yes. It's C++. It, you cannot implement it. I don't have a reason behind it. I have to go check to see what, how the compiler is dealing with it. I don't have a logical reason. Yes, ma'am. Uh, uh, yes, yes, yes. You're going to say equal default. That's not backwards compatible. Perfectly correct. The reason I didn't mention it is that Newer versions of C++ accept that it's like equal delete, equal delete, is things like that. These are things that newly were added to the to the to the language. So I'm not mentioning it because truth is the code that you're going to deal with most likely they're 20 year old code, they are 15 years old code. So the one that applies to everything, I use that one. But absolutely right, you can say equal to default. That's very correct. Many of the things that we are doing, we are teaching latest version of C++, and I always kind of am doubtful about it. Because when you do that and you go to workforce, you use code that you see compiler doesn't compile. You say, why? So because they are using a compiler that is eight years ago. And 90% of the place is that. Yeah, new code, any new company that is doing their stuff, they are doing using new compilers. But maintaining code always happens with old compilers. And believe me, 90% of your job will be maintaining old code, not creating new one. Keep that in mind. Another important thing, for loops. And what comes with C++? When you are writing a program, In your programs, because of C++ features of the fact that, like in C++, you can actually uh, create uh, a variable anywhere. In C language, you can create a variable only at the beginning of the block, which means if I have a while loop over here, something like this, while. In C language, you can create an integer here, This is C language. Or you can create an integer here, only at the beginning of the block. That's how the compiler in C works. In C++, you can create any variable anywhere. You can, have, you can create a variable here if you want to. OK? Not a good idea. It's better to follow the rules of C and always have it at the beginning of the block, because that makes your code organized. And if somebody wants to know what the heck is this, they can go at the top and take a look at it. Number two, avoid doing such thing. Why? The reason is that this is not a portable code. The code you are writing must be a code that you can, why did I say void over here? A portable code is a code that you should be able to get from compiler to compiler, 
write it on Windows, take it on Linux, and it compiles fine. The reason is that some compilers in C++ interpret this thing as int being defined inside the for loop, which means i is not defined at line 8. It goes out of scope. Some compilers, C++ compilers, it has nothing to do with the version. Latest version, new version, that's the case. Some compilers, when you do this, they assume int is defined at line 4. Therefore, it has a meaning at the end. If you write something like this, and you're writing in a compiler that assumes that i is in within the for loop, you have another loop with the i, you put the second integer over there and everything's fine. You move the compiler to another one, it's going to tell you compiler because you have a variable being uh, defined twice. Okay? So avoid this. Don't do this. If you are writing a for loop, Unless you are writing a destructor, it's only one line and you have only one loop over there, nothing else, sure, no problem. But if you are writing a big thing and you have certain loops in there, don't do this. Take the variable up there and reuse your i. It doesn't matter. Nothing's going to go wrong with it. Don't be lazy. Just put it up. Uh, you got to pay for it later if you do it like this. And you move it from compiler to compiler, then you have to go, oh, God, I have to go fix this now. Okay? That's all. That's, those are programming advices that I was talking about. Anybody have any question on those? Okay. Now, now I want your attention over here. This is lecture, actually. What I'm doing right now, I'm actually doing a lecture now. So this is something that you need. And it's going to take around 15 minutes. It's very quick. Thanks to C++. I'll explain to you why. Uh, let's say we didn't have C in and C out. You didn't know what C in and C out out, and you had to still use printf in C, in C++. We could do that, right? It's backwards compatible. So I would say, hey, I'm sick and tired of this thing, and I want to create my own object that prints stuff. I don't want to remember what percent %d is, percent %lf is, percent. I want to be able to have a class that does my printing for me. A utility class. So what you do, you litter, and you know that you have uh, uh, overloading capabilities in C++. So you create a class for yourself, call it output, and then you create functions called PRN in them that accepts different types of arguments. And because of the function overload, they are going to be treated differently. So this output class of mine doesn't have any prop. Uh, uh, attributes and then it's just the utility thing that's supposed to print things for me. If I want to have something like this, or then if I want to print something, I can actually do something like this. So if I want to print a message with it, I'm going to say, my name is Fardad and I'm 53 years old. So I write that thing. I instantiate the f out because I need the f out to print stuff for me. So I instantiate, then I use the f out Fardad output system. <laughs> It's not C out, it's F out. And I'm going to say F out dot print, I print. And then I print an integer. It's going to pick the proper uh, version uh, of the me method, and therefore it's going to get printed properly. Any problem with that? Any problem with this? Beautiful. But it's a pain. I didn't make anything better, for heaven's sake. I keep doing dot prn, dot prn, dot prn. So instead of doing that, I'm going to say, hey, instead of doing this, I'm going to, in here, I'm going to actually return a reference to my class instead of making it void. So instead of doing that, I'm going to say that one, and I'm going to say return this. I can do this, right? And the same thing over here. Of course, I have to type return, not return. Return. So what good it's going to do to, for me? Like, I did this, thank you, but why? Reason is that if I do this, then this function will return a reference of the object, right? Therefore, this f out print is going to return what? f out, correct? So I can simply say, because it's returning a pr f out, I can do this, correct? Because the first one is going to print the name, 
then return this. It's going to grab that this and call the print for it. Print the 53 returns this again and again and again, right? Are we okay with this? Are we okay with this? You're okay, right? All right. Oh, well, wait a minute. I know how to do operator overload, right? So instead of writing PRN, I'm going to say operator this, left shift. That's a left shift operator, binary left shift operator that I'm overloading. Operator, 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 like that, correct? So if it's an operator, now I can actually remove this and put the operator instead. Oh, not that operator, this operator instead. And take this one out and put this operator instead. And take this one out and put this operator instead. Doesn't that look familiar to you? It's C out. So C out doesn't do magic. That's C out. I just wrote C out. That's more just they just put belt, more bells and whistles and flags and formatting and things with it. But that's essentially what it is. Nothing extraordinary. That's exactly what it is. So how come you're not instantiating C out? You know what they have done? Because you only have one console, it doesn't make sense to create an instance of it. When you turn on your computer, the console is there, right? So C out should be the same. When you use C out, they all should be the same. I should not have two different C outs. Therefore, they instantiated C out in IO stream, and they made it a global variable. So that C out of yours is a truly global variable instantiated in IO stream. And wherever you include, the first time you include IO stream, it actually creates an instance of C out. Then it becomes available everywhere. Everywhere else that you're including IO stream, you're using the good, good old C out that you had before. And you keep doing that. So C out is essentially that. Are we okay with this? And it's the exact same with C, with C in. Change that to input and make this thing write operator and make that the scanf. Works the same way. Absolutely no difference. Are we okay with this? All right. All right, now that I have this thing, think about it. If I wanted to actually design a class like this to do all these stuff, but instead of printing on F out, print it into a file, how would I have designed it? If I wanted to do something like this, so this is essentially C out, right? So, so this is essentially what, 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 is what we have. So in here we actually have include IO stream, namespace STD, and this is C out, right? So my question is, C out is already doing the job for all the formatting and stuff, right? It formats everything, it prints it, however I want to do it. So I want to do that in a file, right? Why do I have to write the whole thing again? I have it, so let's just use what it has and do it in a file. If I wanted to do that, what do I need to, first of all, it's a file. It cannot be just the C out because C out is one console. With file, you can have 50 files. So that you have to instantiate. You cannot make it global because every file is different, right? For each file, you need a separate object that it has its own state and everything. If that's the case, then I have to create a class that can print in a file. If I wanted to create a class, what do you think I should have passed to the constructor? to print in a file. Huh? No. This is object oriented. Don't think low level, think high level. If you want an object to print something in a file, what do you pass to that file? The name of the file, right? If I wanted a, an object to print something in a file, I would have passed the name of the file. Actually, the O stream, I O stream, the I O stream class, it has two children. One is O F stream, the other one is I F stream. 
So OF stream is actually child of C out. So it does exactly what C out does. So instead of that, I can say OF stream. Of course, these are all in a header file called F stream, so I have to add that. What happened? Include um, F stream. Okay, so I'm going to say OF stream, let's call it file out. And I'm going to say age report. Dot txt. And now, because OF stream is child of C out, it does exactly what C out does. I don't need to learn anything new. I simply say, file out exactly what I did with C out. I don't need to learn anything new. Everything is the same thing. Instead of the screen, it's going to go into a file. Which file? Report.txt. Oh, I need to close that file. No, I don't. Because I know classes have destructors. Any sane programmer, if they are creating a class for a, for a, for a file, in a constructor, they open it, and in the destructor, they're going to close it, right? I don't need to worry about it. The destructor is going to close it. Yes, of course, if I want to close it, they have, a, they have a method for it. Just say file out dot close, it's going to close it. No problem. Okay? If you want to reopen something, you can dot open and put a new name and do something else with it. But no worries, it's object oriented. They, they took care of it. So if I run this beautiful program of mine three years later, Nothing's going to come on the screen. Obviously not. Why? Because it's right here. Report.txt. And if I open it, ta -da -da -da, it's right over there. Absolutely no problem. So essentially, when I told you thanks to C++, I do not need to, I need, I do not need to teach much about this, is that every single thing you know about C out applies to a file. No difference. Right justified, left justified, go to new line, whatever you did works in here. Exactly the same. Anything you did in C in is going to work over here. Absolutely no difference. Which means if I write a code like this, I'm saying f stream in file. So this one is so oh, 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 if stream. I'm going to say if stream in file, and I'm going to go report.txt. So I'm reading from the file, right? So, so if I want, I I put the wrong version over here. There you go. That's what I wanted to do. So if I write this over here, what's going to happen? What is the output of this code? Think that in file is C in. Assume you say C in into a string, and somebody types the whole thing and hits enter at the end. What's going to go into string? What's going to go into SDR? What? No, go ahead. What's going to go in there? Uh, kind of right, but no. You know, which one is going to? Just imagine that. Imagine you wrote C in. C in name. That's it. So you are redirecting to name. And somebody to typed over there, Fred space Soleil. What's going to go into name? Only the first one, right? In here is the exact same thing because space is the limiter, my is going to go into SDR. Only my. And it stops, and the rest remains in the file. As the rest remains in the buffer of the keyboard, remember you wrote flush and stuff, exactly the same. The good thing about file is that you are not dealing with that idiot user. It's a file. You know what's the format. You read what you expect. If you can't read, you just stop. And you say, at record, yada, 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 you have corrupted data. Fix your data file. You don't need to say, enter again, do this, do that. You don't need to. 
because now you're dealing with files. You can look at the format of the file and plan for it. Its name and then a comma. So what you do, you read the name up to comma using get line. You know how to do it. You stop, you ignore one character, the comma is passed, you read the next up to comma. So you can plan for what you're reading. As simple as that. Again, nothing new is needed. Now, if I want to read everything one by one, what do I do? How does C in? How does C in cannot read? How can C in tell you I cannot read anymore? What happens? If you ask for someone's age and you want to put it in an integer and the person enters 25 with TW something something, what happens to C in? C in fails, right? C in fails. It's the exact same thing. So I want to read everything? No problem. I'm going to say while not F in file dot fail while it didn't fail keep reading and print so it's gonna read 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 when it hits the end of the file it can't read anymore right it's gonna tell you I failed and the result will be this it reads every token, every single thing, and prints it out. Of course, if I had it planned, then I could get that as, a, as an integer. But I didn't have any plan. Like I would say, enter the age at column something, or put it age after a comma, or whatever, if I wanted to do. You don't read. This is a text file. A file that you are reading is usually comma separated, tab separated, so you can actually detect which field is where by, by getting to a delimiter. But this is just an example. Now, the good thing is that you want to read it again? Absolutely no problem. First of all, at line 15, you are 100% sure that C in failed, right? Otherwise, it, 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 it was in the loop, right? The loop ended because that failed. So right over there, say, I know it's failed. Let's clear things up. So you're going to say in file dot clear. Done. It's clear. Now I want to go back to the beginning. Okay? There is actually, so there is an app for that. <laughs> there is a method for that. You simply say in file dot seek G. G stands for get. Not forget. It stands for space get. All right? So it means it's for reading. If you are doing C out, it's seek P for putting. Okay? So to go to certain place. I can say seek G. It means go to the, and in here you put the address. Beginning of the file is address zero, right? There you go. I'm at the beginning of the file. Now I can read again. And when I run this, it's going to read my. Because it went back at the beginning. Simple as that. If I wanted to, I could say, go to byte 15. So it would go to 15 and start reading from 15. So you can have access anywhere in the file. That's a good thing. Like you can go back and forth in a file, analyze the file, do whatever you want to do. It's a file, back, forth. Exact same thing for output. If you wanted to like change uh, things in a file, you can simply go into the file and write at a specific location in a file. But for that, a marriage had to happen. IF stream and OF stream got married, and they had a child. That child is called F stream, multiple inheritance. That's only in C++. So we had two input and output, and they had a child F stream. So if you wanted to do the same thing in here with F stream, now in file in here, I'm not going to call it in file anymore. <clears throat> I'm going to actually call it file. Why do I do that? Because, yeah, no, 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 okay, okay, okay. Current project, current document, okay. All right, so I'm going to make it a file. Now that file can read and write because it's the child of both things. But because it's like that, I cannot just put a name over there. I have to tell it how to open it. Because I'm opening it for reading, it's a flag for that. So I have got to put iOS in. And that's the input. OK? What are these flags? 
we have them all all in here somewhere notes <coughs> Where are they? Really? Seriously? No. That far? Oh, first of all, this is the hierarchy that I was talking about. iOS, iStream, OStream, IOStream, FStream is child of that one. Therefore, it knows how to input and how to output. It's child of both. What are those flags that you can use? The flags are all here. There you go. <clears throat> so if you want to apply many flags, separate them with a bar. Okay, so you can say iOS in bar, iOS out bar, iOS turned bar. So you add the bar, it applies out. So I want if I want it for input, that's open for input. Output is iOS out. Append no matter what you do, it's going to write at the end. Even if you seek to the halfway through the file, it will ignore it. It will always add to the end because you said, I want to append. Truncate, if the file already exists for, re for writing, it shrinks it, zilch it, it makes it zero, wipes it out. So whenever, if you want to delete a file, just open it with truncate. It deletes the contents of the file. If you want to write new stuff in it, that's again, truncate is your friend. ATE, it opens at end, which means it opens for writing, but writes at the end. Therefore, you can come back and write in the middle too. It's not like append. Append only writes at the end, right? At end, <clears throat> writes at the end and can write any other places. So again, you add them, uh, separate them with a bar, and that's how it works. So if I want to open it for input and output, and at the same time append, that's what I'm going to do. If I want it to be only for <clears throat> output and trunk, which means I want to open it, wipe it out, and then write into it, it's out and trunk. <clears throat> and these are the defaults. So if you say IF stream, if you don't add anything as second argument, it's always for input. If it's OF stream that I created, it's always output. If it's F stream, it's input and output. Okay? And that's it. So <clears throat> there is nothing behind the scene over here and nothing, nothing new for me to teach you because you already know how to work with C in and C out. Anything you have done, any function you have used in C in and C out, that's the one. The only additional functions you need to know are and of course there are much more. For, <clears throat> there is, for IF stream, it's tell, it's uh, seek G, so it's, uh, I'm going to say file.seekg, okay? Seek G either goes <clears throat> to a position in a file, so you put 32, it means goes to byte 32, okay? Or you can say from where, okay? So you're going to say, from the beginning, go 30 bytes forward. Or you can say from end, go minus 30 bytes. Go to the end, come one back. Or from current position, go wherever. These are all three, four, five. We don't need it now, okay? I'm just letting you know. So this way that it is, is iOS current, iOS end, or iOS BEG for beginning. Three different things you can put it. Google it, you'll find out. Simply say seek G and it tells you exactly what you're going to put. And make sure you cast those values. So if you are putting in here an integer, okay, uh, for if you are using two things, current position, make sure you cast it to I, uh, standard stream offset. So you cast the value because that integer is a special integer. You have to cast it. Uh, that's that. And um, another thing that you have is I'm going to put over here 32 just so that file.tellg. 
tell G doesn't accept an argument, but it returns a value. The value that it returns is of type position, which means it tells you where right now I'm writing. Oh, where, I'm, where now I'm reading. Like if it says 54, it means I'm reading from on, on, at byte 54. That's a beautiful thing to easily find out what is the size of a file. So what you can do, you can open a file for reading, then seek to end zero, which means it goes to the end and stands over there and say, tell G, tell me where you are right now. It's going to tell you 9,564. It means your file is 9,564 bytes in length. OK? Uh, the exact same function exists for O stream, uh, for I st uh, for O stream, and they are they are using P. So seek G and seek P is for put. So seek seek for putting stuff in a file. Tell me where you are putting stuff in here. Seek where you are getting stuff, and seek tell me where are you getting from. That's all. So these are all the things that you need to know. Uh, and there is nothing else. That's all. That's files in C++. Up to the point that we need to know. You are not dealing with binary stuff. One thing I have to tell you, um, in this iOS stuff that we have that nobody mentions, <laughs> in these iOS stuff, there is a type called iOS scope resolution binary. That's for... DOS com <laughs> computers. When I say DOS, because essentially Windows <laughs> is a fancy DOS. Poor thing still has two different files for binary and, and text. If you go on Linux, on your MacBooks, on any Unix-based operating system, everything's binary. Why do we need to have a text? Text is from dinosaurs' time when they actually had different type of code. They used seven bits. Uh, of a byte for text because they were counting how many bits I have in my computer. These days, nobody cares we have. So, so that's the thing. So uh, in here, if you want to actually read binary data from a file, we don't know how at this moment and we don't want to know, then you go iOS binary to open something for binary uh, in, in here. Binary is simply ignored in Linux because everything is binary no matter what you do. And that's why when you guys FTP, you have to go, how many, I don't know how many of you actually do it, but when you FTP, you have to go and check the transfer mode and set it to text when you're putting your code in on matrix. Because if you don't do it, then it's gonna add some garbage at the end when you're bringing it back. So always set it to text when you're going back and forth. And that's that. Finished, I'm off my queue. Any questions? Yes. There are other ways, but streams are easier ways. Oh, really? Yeah, you can have buffered and non-buffered, but oh. ooh, that's <laughs> long, many, many years from now. <laughs> you don't need to do that. You always want it buffered at this moment. Okay, with our level of knowledge, yes, that's the only, only streams. The fact, okay, I'm gonna pause this because it's too rich for our blood.